It all started on the 12th of May 1993 when uh, Ocean Vagabond sunk while I was captain it across the Atlantic, five crew aboard, force 10 storm. It was, a, it was the worst storm I've ever been in at sea and I've been, I've been across the Atlantic five times now. And just to add to that, we go and hit a container in the middle of the uh, open sea and it splits the bow of the boat open and, and a whole lot of crazy stuff went on. And it was during that, the time of the sinking and, and the time of being picked up from the life raft and we were dead in between Bermuda and the Azores, a thousand miles from land. And it was, it was that time when I just thought so much about everything, so much about life. You do so when you're on the, on the ocean at any point in time. And, and, and it, um, so anyway, something in the head started me thinking about um, Atlantic windsurfing. Well, we have most of the logistics done. We've got about three months and 10 days left, and uh, well, it's all over the place, actually. When you've been doing something for four years non-stop and you've invested everything in it, your passion's there, no matter how annoying the project gets and how stressed you get, it's everything. And at the moment, the, the whole project is basically my life. If I was to take away the Atlantic from what I do, there would be nothing there at the moment. I mean, there really is nothing there without the Atlantic. Windsurfing across the Wind Atlantic? Windsurfing across the Atlantic, yeah. There's an awful lot of money at stake. I think you're crazy. <laughs> Most of my money, all of my money, is invested in the project. Mm. There's a lot of other people's money who believed in what I was doing. I want it to succeed to be able to pay back the people that believed in the project. That, that for me, is the most important thing. Four years of my life. Windsurfing across the Atlantic is going to be a long ride. I don't know how exactly it's going to happen, but it is happening. Four years down the line, everything's coming together. We've got this far, we're still waiting on one phone call to make sure that we can still go. We've got um, 70 people waiting on tender hooks at the moment for this phone call. And then hopefully we can um, go for it. If it does, it's going to be the adventure of a lifetime. Hope. Okay, okay mate, cheers. How's it going? Well, the uh, European teams are going to be meeting up with the uh, American guys in JFK Airport, New York. And then, then they've got the 2,000 mile trip here to Canada, so it's going to be a, a long, long trip. I'm a, I'm a yacht master by nature, so I, I, I was able to format pretty well how we could do something like this, even though it's pretty complex, and even now we're still discussing better ways of doing it. But it was, it's trying to convince people, first of all, that it's a good idea. You go to investors and you say, I've got a great idea where you should put your money. A transatlantic windsurf race. And they're going, hmm, maybe, but I think I'll put it in stocks and shares. You know. What we're going to do is we're going to try and um, hire a van and um, put, some more, put some more equipment on the van and drive that up ourselves. You know, we think, you know, it's uh, luggage and passenger. Luggage means, you know, it's more luggage, but this is, is, is wide on the bus. In America, we have a saying, you can't put 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. If you want to punctuate this aspect of this journey, I think that might help.
two weeks ago I had a sponsor pull out for eighty thousand dollars. Two weeks before the race starts, and that's where the financial issue came to its biggest head that it ever has done, and has done in the in the four years that the company's been set up. Well, I felt like I've I felt like I've been sort of completely isolated, cut off. I don't mean there haven't been people helping. There's been some people who've been giving me so much help, but I, I'm, I'm just you know help from everybody else, and that practically ruined me. That, that practically ruined me for life. You know, you couldn't even get them to support probably the biggest, the biggest race that's ever happened in their sport, uh, and certainly the most media coverage. Everyone is so slow. It's unbelievable. You wouldn't believe. She wants us to get on the bus so we don't miss the ferry. And I agree with her. It's all right if we push up behind you and give you a little push to accelerate. I know it's probably 150 mile an hour. It might work. I guess we'll just keep going. Just pedal to the metal. Don't stop it. Thank you. These two weeks have been uh, by far the most difficult yet in my life. Uh, in fact, I mean, it's been pretty much uh, ridiculous to insane. I've slept like nothing in two weeks. Um, I've had to I found another forty thousand dollars in investment in two weeks. I've done all kinds of um, uh, deals which I didn't really think were quite possible. But uh, uh, you know we've we've done it now, and uh, and the boat will leave that dock tomorrow. It's a long way, but we're really trying to make it. We're just trying to flat out. Okay, is there anywhere to lay the um, ferry? Okay, because it really is so imperative. Uh, it looks like our directions are are wrong. <laughs> We're gonna stop and find out uh, if that's true. Okay, great. He he took a right down this road, so we walk, we're driving down the border. And when that's completely wrong, we need to go straight across here. Yes, it's possible that people's lives are, are on the line, um, are, are at risk. There is a risk, for sure. They all know that. I'll repeat myself again, if they don't know that, they shouldn't be doing it, but I think they all do. Um, but, uh, I mean, I hate to sort of bring paraphrasing or, or into it, but, you know, everything's a risk in life, and we're all aware of that. And, and, and some people are prepared to take seemingly greater risks. But then again, if they're prepared for what they're doing, then it's almost less of a risk than being unprepared for more mundane things which happen. What's up, you good? Running for the ferry as usual. So, um, done a 28 hour journey, we've got 10 minutes to go. Cutting it to the last minute as usual. Like 1,200 miles, you know, back and forth, you know, for $500. No, 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 $1,000. dollars they pay you, They're willing to pay when? you what you want. All right, let me go to sleep and then we'll okay. do this tomorrow. No problem. Getting hold of, um, as I call it, a mothership, the boat, which could, um, which had the, uh, the correct facilities and logistics for what we wanted to do was probably one of the biggest headaches. We had to have helicopter deck. We had to have a lot of deck space for rigid inflatable boats. We had to have cranes. We needed a lot of accommodation because we knew we wanted, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 people. So when you put all that together, it, it's, it's quite a task trying to find a vessel like that. So after three, four months of searching for, no, it's more than that, probably about eight months, um, I was reading the Sunday Times uh, one morning and uh, I saw a picture of that thing. Um, so um, I called up the, uh, uh, the agent and um, I said, I said, um, you know that boat, you know, the Captain Klebnikov. So I said, um, does it do, could you hire the whole boat?
certain members, people like Anders and, and Robert, it's it's the the physical dangerous elements that are the attraction. I, I don't worry about dangerous. I think it's uh, calculated risks is what it's all about. And then you know if it gets too nasty, you time out, hop on the boat and wait it out. I mean that's simple. And past that you have all these electronic things and hopefully the tender driver is going to be good enough to keep close to you and if it gets too nasty you have to stay close to the boat and you know take it for that there's always you can be that brave but at one stage you still have to go security above glory you know there's a lot of windsurfers who aren't here as well who shared that um want for the risk as it were for the excitement um who didn't make it for one reason or another um and that, that that's that's why people want to do it. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Transatlantic Wind Turf Race. My name is Andy Groom. I don't know my official title here, but I think race coordinator. One minute I'm hanging 45 degrees off this boat, and I'm in Rich's boat. The next minute the, roll, the boat rolls 35 degrees the other way, and I'm 20 meters from it. The point of this evening's briefing, stroke meeting, is just to get everyone together and let you know a little bit about what's going to go on for this uh, week ahead. We realize you've had uh, a slightly small journey on a coach. We understand that you would rather just get back to your room. We'll make this as quick and easy as possible. Over here on the right is Richard Clifford. He is our safety officer, and he's a very important key point. We three, three boats, we should stick to the plan. And unfortunately, I swayed for us. Sarah, this is KK, over. Hugo, I think you all know. He's um, assistant to Louis. He's putting the whole thing together. At the back there, hiding, keeping very quiet. Ross Kerr's like, he's our whip commander. The reason I've got the team that I have is that we are used to working on board ships in this environment uh, for long periods of time. The missing man at the moment is the main man himself, Louis Hubbard. I believe he's coming to the seat of the travel club. some peace. Oh, we're not going to be ready. Still working on the boats, the ribs. Um, one of them hasn't got an engine. Um, they've got nowhere to stow them at the moment when the boat's rolling at sea. The environment we come from is the fact that you're here and all you've got is what is on board this ship. So therefore it's no good uh, moaning about what we could have had and what we should have got. The fact is that we're here now and we've got to achieve our aim. They're not good, but they're not bad. They're not, they were meant to be perfect built, beautiful little babies, but now they've turned into one with no engine. But that's not a problem. We have paddles. <laughs> Still got a lot of supplies to get. Got to work out how we're going to pay for that. So that's twelve thousand. Yeah. So tomorrow we'll leave here. It's it's such a beautiful place. It is a truly amazing place. And I've I do you know the one thing I look forward to this more than anything is is being out there in the middle of nothing. It'd be a bit different being an icebreaker rather than a sailing yacht. And, uh, and hopefully getting away from everybody else and just, just sounds pathetic, no it doesn't, being at peace almost, you know, you, you just, you think and you, 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 you can really, really think about everything when you're out in the sea and that, that, that's, that's something I like. Yeah, maybe, yeah? Uh, when I leave, my wife, she cry. <laughs> because you never know, the, the sea can be, can be unbelievable. So we need to really be respect also on the other side.
about four miles outside the harbour. We've got good weather for doing this testing. This is what we needed. Um, we're going to stick the ribs in now. They're going to be in there. They're going to run around for four or five hours. They're going to take all the shit and the crap fuel out of them, get the oil circulating. They've got to have oil changes, some of them. And we need to get the, end, the windsurfers out with them and, and practice getting them on and off. I mean, everybody's a bit all over the place at the moment. Nobody's focused enough and it's, it's, it needs to be sorted out. Richard's got to come down hard people now and, and actually start them moving because otherwise we're going to lose today. We're going to be in tomorrow and we're still going to be clocking around and it's going to be next Monday before we even get anything done. So we need to be quick. Well, we've got two boats in the water. Um, it's two more than I thought we'd have about half an hour ago. We've still got problems with the curvature of the ship and the craning. Language problems, they've got different techniques to what we've got. And uh, I just hope we can sort it out. At the moment, it's calm weather. If we have calm weather going across, we can achieve our aim. If uh, it starts blowing and we have swell of even two metres, we're going to have problems when the boats get in the water. The coxswains, to all intents and purposes, are in control to the last minute. Here, the ship's in control, or the crane's in control, until the last minute. We'll have to play it by ear. Set, go! We have got some very good safety equipment on board and everyone knows how to use the, the equipment and it is certainly adequate for this particular job, providing it all works. And this race hinges on good communications. Well, you bloody well get down there and do it, all right? Well, I don't mean that. We have to tell him what's happening. Today's gone well. We haven't had a lot of wind practically nothing so it's not been the best for the wind surface to test in but we've been able to take the ribs in and out of the water we've practiced getting the sailors in and out of the water and it's quite nice it's been relatively well very smooth this was kindergarten school today and everybody got an a had we not done this practice today and gone out into the ocean we'd have had all sorts of problems so i think it's been a most beneficial day effectively what we have now are four groups Four teams, and they, th th there's three people who have done such a lot for this project. There's Mr. John Chow from American Windsurfer. Having uh, seen Louis go through hell and myself as, as well, just trying to bring it together was a huge challenge. Yazoo from Liberty, and, uh, and Theo, Theo and Yanis from, uh, from Greece. It looks strong. They have a very, you know, strong feeling for the event. Greek team, the best. But anyway, we're ready for everything. And we're targeting the first position. What else? Yeah? I've been uh, racing around the world uh, since 1981, 82. Uh, some years ago I quit, but however, I'm still uh, competitive. I take part in the World Cup in Paris each year. I feel good about it. I think. Um our team's pretty much 100% prepared and, uh, you know, I think our equipment's ready as well. So get ready for the rest of it. They, they stuck with it, they formatted teams, it's been amazing. The Team Liberty has basically been uh, my, my which is sponsored, Yasso, from uh, Japan that really got us motivated to go and do this thing. We, we sat down and tried to create a team that, uh, you know, that one would fit with the rules here, which means that in many ways we were racing on the European community flag. And, um, and we said, well, you know, he's sponsored already, we'll bear myself. He goes, you know, you guys should do it. A chance like this to do the, the transatlantic is not every day, so... Uh, I love the sports, it's my job and everything, and then if I don't do, maybe I regret, you know? Managed to get the two of us all organized. Then out of the, the blue came that we need a third sailor. So uh, naturally, we, we try to pick a sailor that would be 
little bit, probably a little bit less image, but more performance oriented. So uh, Niklas then came in, which is fantastic. No, I think I'm on good back off of those guys. It's really nice that I'm letting them have a chance here. Even, even if I'm not the one of the top five ranked in the world or anything, they're really nice that they're letting me have a chance in this race. Uh, Captain, are you aware that we've got amateur and professional windsurfers in this race? And that uh, it's such a hazardous event, I think, to mix the two is, um, is asking a bit much. Oh, yeah. Right, this is Dennis. Hi. Got his name right, hopefully. Uh, French teammate number one. And uh, Antoine. And this is Antoine. French um, team number two. Yeah, we sort of uh, met uh, probably about an hour after of, um, arriving here in St John's. We've been on a coach ride for a little while and they were down one end of the bus sleeping, I was down the other end of the bus sleeping. Um, and we sort of got together, started chatting and that. And um, here we are. I was the first to sign this contract with Louis Hubbard uh, in Frankfurt, at the indoor in Frankfurt. And it was a very um, emotive uh, moment. It was like, I, I thought Louis is uh, very uh, um, happy. It's an adventure. It's more, of a fa it's more of a family, it's more of a unit. It's more of a, come on guys, we're gonna, we're gonna race together, all four teams, and we're gonna get across the other side of the Atlantic, and we're gonna prove to people that it could happen, that it has happened, and we're gonna show them how amazing it looks. And sure, we'll race as well. I heard about the race through American Windsurfer magazine um, through John Chow and I just emailed him and I thought wow this would be really exciting and I love adventure and I didn't think they were gonna have any women compete um, and I just asked if that was a possibility and he said sure he didn't hear from any other women um, and he decided he'd, he'd like to have a woman on the team so we worked it out got some sponsorship together and, and here I am we have um, Eddie Petrocelli, who's um, really low-key, very strong sailor, um, kind of quiet and and a good, like, solid, solid force on the team. There's um, Jace, who's the youngest on the team. He's just loads of fun, <laughs> always keeps everyone laughing. And same with David. He's the oldest on the team, but he acts just like a kid. He's, he's always joking around. And then myself, and then our leaders, John Chow and Ken Winner. And Ken's very serious and gets the job done, but he's our technical wizard. You know, I've been windsurfing for 23 years, and most of these guys haven't been windsurfing as long. And so I'm here to, to offer advice and to help them out. If you'd asked me, before I had all these financial problems, what the most difficult part of, of, of the whole project would be, I'd say, well, it'd be doing the actual race. It's only after the last few weeks and all the hassles that I've gone through that I've mentally and physically believed that nothing could be worse than what I've just gone through. And I hope that's the case. Um, but I mean, we're going to have 10 days of, um, of of fate, you know, stepping in when it likes and, and deciding how it is and is not going to end up. What I'm doing is programming the GPSs so that they all read with the same um, data because you can adjust the data to give grid or nautical Im information. You can adjust the time. Um, you can adjust the way the position is given. And I'm making sure that they all read with the same units. And this is very important for the, for the race so that we know we're all speaking from the same uh, sheet of music. Much better, much better. Over. Yeah, I think we've got it sussed. I'm definitely looking forward to getting on the water, even though there's no wind. I'm just looking forward to getting off the boat and then getting wet. Hopefully, keep my lunch down. Okay, copy, grease, Yeah. Go, go. <laughs> Liberty team in. 
right out, right as well. We've decided that the racing is going to be in a tag format style, where the different team sailors swap over with each other on the water, either when they get tired or when the conditions suit their teammates better. So, in effect, uh, there is only one rule, which is that every team must have one of its sailors on the water at all times. Otherwise, it's the team's own tactical decisions as to how they want to play the race. Each of the teams has its own rigid inflatable boat, which is piloted by a, a ex Royal Marine coxswain. And um, that rib is specifically there to, to protect that sailor, no matter what shit he gets himself into. We'll start sailing at dawn and continue throughout the day, awarding points to each of the teams depending on where they finish. And then in around eight days time, when we eventually reach England, if we reach England, then uh, we will have an overall winner. out there. It's not like any sailing I've ever done and it was a rush. I broke an owl haul though. I, I thought I had my energy back and then my owl haul broke and I was treading water and the guys luckily came by with the knife and I could cut it but by then I was just pooped. But it was fun. That was just, that was just an awesome experience. It has sunk in and it hit hard so I just got this pit in my stomach. I mean I knew it would be crazy out here. I just Again, just watching the ribs get in and out of the water and recovering the gear, that's what's the, that's what's the scariest part because there's potential for injury is huge. Look! Look! How big? That's big. That, that's a swell. That's, that's a swell. Pretty amazing. That's what it's all about. You've been quite lucky, actually. But it's some of these big ones, it's coming in, I mean, uh, every, you know, there's waves of large swell coming in. And I should say it's topping four, four and a half. It's big. It's big enough to scare the shit out of most people. Thank you. You'll be fine. We were both watching all the time. They have moved your harness line around the scale. Mentally, I'm, um, I'm afraid of it. I mean, <laughs> it is, it's a, I was afraid when I was uh, in the middle of the ocean, like, I, I'm over sailed, I'm over sailed. It's very um, strange sensation, but anyway, uh, I'll go again with a smaller sail. It will be all right, I hope.
It's nice, very, it's good fun out there. It's really, really rough, but you have to use all the power you got and hopefully make it. <laughs> pinch me, please, pinch me. I can't believe it, really. I'm so, so stoked. Well, <laughs> not such a good start for us. Uh, Micah has been suffering from uh, seasick, and uh, I still think that uh, if we get lucky, uh, and uh, if we get used to the conditions, we can do a little better. This is my broken out, hole. broken out hole out on the ocean. And the reason I'm saving this is because I had to bite through this rope. <laughs> and I want you all to know that I still have some of this rope between my teeth. Did you have to bite through it? <laughs> they came with a knife, and I could get the last part with a knife. But until then, I was sitting there cleaning it like a corn cob. <laughs> <laughs> My maths is as good as everyone else's, and uh, it's, a, it's 1,900 miles, and uh, we've done 420 miles. Uh, but I can actually cheat because by looking at the GPS, it's 1,456.9 miles to go. We were going to continue on the Great Circle route to UK. Had we done so, we, this morning we would be here, and as you can see from these lines we would then be in five meters of swell. In order to avoid that, during the night, we transited south, slightly to the south, on a course of 120, to take us into a smaller swell. said from the beginning that we had our limits to what we could uh, safely protect people in and uh, I hate to be boring and I hate to say it over and over again but if we can't look after the safety of people out there then nobody can go out it's as simple as that I know it's all about adventure and uh, it's a big wave uh, and danger but look at this these are, this, look at this one this is four this is five meter swells easy well, we've worked in weather. We've worked in conditions like this before, right? But it's the old. We know our limitations, you know. And it's we can quite happily run along here all day, but it's getting in and out of the boat. That's getting out in and out of this. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I was sitting in my bed and it got a little bit rocky. And when I say a little bit rocky, I mean 35, 40 degrees all the way over and pinned. And in my room, I have this very special bed. It looks like a V and you never get knocked out of it. But this time it rocked over so hard and there was a little bit of a bump and it chucked me right out of the bed. And I did one, two, three into the door and then one, two, three into the bed and I got these. And then since I wasn't wearing any clothing, I got them all over my butt as well. <laughs> Actually, the swell will die down in 12 hours after the wind. Uh, and uh, maybe, maybe in the evening we'll have no so big swell, but now it is still about four, four and a half meters. I think that the chance of the swell will go down very fractionally during the day. Yeah, I hear it. Yeah. So. That's the only problem. Yeah. Yeah. It could be a major problem. 
I mean, I know the argument is if you can get two and you can get three in, but I mean, we're doing everything right next to the sure. game, and why, why complicate it even more? If yeah. one goes down, we've still got another in the opposite. If one goes down, it means the only other rip has got to do the rescue of that, and the wind surface have just got to mill around. And it could Whereas take it, a long time. Which could take a long time to do the transfer. My own feeling is we go for a launch. Yeah. And uh, if the swell just dies down, we don't, we don't get any problems. Let's give it a go. Yeah, OK. adventure so uh, I'm still my heart uh, not beating too much right now but it will no. I'm, I will have to try try once and I will know by myself okay Antoine it's not for you it's for Anders it's for Robert it's not for Antoine
six o'clock we were here that's about seven as I said 770 nautical miles from St. John's and about uh, 1300 nautical miles to UK <laughs> Can you find me the pilot right now, please? We have a windsurfer who's just gone down. He actually uh, communicated with KK, but uh, the, we have two ribs somewhere close to him. that uh, go to him and uh, ask him to get into uh, your rib and uh, get him back to KK over uh, KK this is zero did you acknowledge it over Suffering with the uh, the extreme conditions and the swell, um, very quickly became tired. And once you're tired and spending time in the water, was swallowing water. And uh, as we all saw, he wasn't quite himself uh, when he got back on board. And it took him a while to warm up, but he but he was fine. Had, had we stayed on the Great Circle route, which is this line, we'd have got into stronger winds, winds and uh, bigger seas. As it was, even down here, we were getting five meter swells.
I'm getting my sea legs back, and then that was that was way funner sailing than any of the other days. Just kind of got kind of got lucky here on the back end of the boat when we got really close. It was you know whoever got the swell, uh, the wake off of the, the big ship, and uh, I just happened to catch a good swell and just pushed me right by Andres right at the end there. So. One thing that really worries me is getting the boats in and out of the water. I mean, we've got a we've got a hell of an experienced crew, but even still, they've got to handle two and a half tons of boat, and, and that's not going to be easy. And then jumped out, he tried to move the boat, and we had the, the boat swinging. Oh my goody god! on that boat. That was probably the most scary time of my life. I can't think of anything that I've done to date. I don't know of anyone else in the world who launches boats with a Russian crane uh, in five metre swells. Short sleeve, short leg wetsuit. This kind of finish is not good, not good. Okay, Robert. R Robert's not a man, he's a robot. And uh, I think that's just to cover up his metal skeleton. It's out of his mind. Keep an eye. Andres, keep an eye on me, eh? Don't lose, eh? 
Okay, we're ready. Clear, guys. this image of four sailors and boom 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 this flipper <laughs> you know but nobody got eaten alive so we all hope that's safe here on board those are dolphins again today god damn it i've missed them every day We've just passed Start Point and we're approaching Portland Bill. And uh, we've just given the ETA to the Coast Guard as uh, 1500. And the time now is 12.30. So we've got a few miles to go. We must have about 45 miles to go to Portland Bill. Great job. Okay, guys. <laughs> hey, man. Have a win. Have a win, man. Good to see you. Woo. I've been really looking forward. I've been looking forward to this day since five minutes out of St. John's. <laughs> so I'm definitely glad it's here. Uh, just kind of nervous about uh, getting land sick. But doctors and everybody on board were telling me you're going to feel land sick for a couple days, so I haven't felt anything yet, but i uh, got a couple days to find out. Come give us some love. <laughs> we did it as a team, you know. <laughs> we took our turns. Everyone went in the water, no matter what condition it was. And, you know, so we strive as a team and we, you know, have defeat as a team. And for me, to see them all get to the beach and be happy, you know, to be ecstatic that they're on English soil, 
that was the best, the best time for me. Everybody on this boat has been superb, and in their own little ways have all helped. And the vibe and the spirit on this boat is amazing. The boat crews have been amazing. I know, I know very few people in their right mind which could do what they've done. And uh, they've done it without complaining. I mean, I think they've done an incredible job. In March 2000, from Portugal to Brazil, we've already signed a deal, so uh, transatlantic racing will live on for windsurfing. one hell of an experience. And I think on the whole it's been something we can always look back on as, yeah, we, we did it. The hardest part wasn't the bus ride or anything like that, it's saying goodbye to everyone. Because it's a great group, I don't think you could ever put a random group of people together and come out with such a good mix of people. Awesome people, awesome time, awesome experience. Some people will uh, will look at it and be inspired by it. Some people will look at it and think it's a big waste of money. I hope some sponsors will look at it and say, oh, I'll be part of that next time around. I do like things to be successful, for sure. It all came together. It all worked. And Louis was right. Ha <laughs> ha